Okay, guys, hey, uh, today we're going to be talking about The Conscious Mind by David Chalmers. This is going to be the first part of the series uh, because we are also reading another part from the same book in the next lesson, but let's just lay the groundwork for today. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Chalmers, like Dennett, is another contemporary philosopher, meaning he's alive and teaching and writing. Um, he's Australian, and he's known specifically for his philosophy of mind and philosophy of language. Uh, but the philosophy of mind stuff is really how this guy got his start. Um, the Conscious Mind, I, I think, is actually the book that made him a uh, kind of household name within philosophical circles. And he has this interesting website, conch.net. It's like the first five letters of consciousness.net that contains all these resources and like documentation of all these things throughout history that have been written about consciousness. So that's pretty cool if you want to check it out. But here's the opening question for today. Are there any contemporary arguments for dualism? We know that there are quote-unquote, early modern and ancient arguments for dualism because we've seen them. But the question is, are there any present-day defenses of dualism? Because in the last lesson, we saw how Dennett was a fervent opponent of dualism, and I wanted you to start to think about if there were modern, rather contemporary ways of defending it. Uh, the answer to that question is, yeah. And we're going to see that with Chalmers at some point. And it's up to you guys to see who gets the better of the argument. So let's start on page three. Chalmers says, Conscious experience is at once the most familiar thing in the world and the most mysterious. There is nothing we know about more directly than consciousness, but it is far from clear how to reconcile it with everything else we know. Why does it exist? What does it do? How could it possibly arise from lumpy gray matter? We know consciousness far more intimately than we know the rest of the world, but we understand the rest of the world far better than we understand consciousness. So there's this ironic component to the study of consciousness because on the one hand, it's the most familiar thing to us. It's the thing that you are. It's the thing that you enter the world through, right? It's, it's the thing closest to you. It's that thing behind your eyes, so to speak, that each and every one of us know in a really personal and private way. Nothing can be more certain. But at the same time, it's also the most mysterious because we don't know a lot about it. And he says it's interesting that we know consciousness more intimately than we know about the world, but we understand the world better than we understand consciousness. Very strange, very strange. But it continues, he says, Consciousness can be startlingly intense. It is the most vivid of phenomena. Nothing is more real to us. But it can be frustratingly diaphanous. When it comes to talking about conscious experience, it is notoriously difficult even to pin down the subject matter. The internal, I'm sorry, the International Dictionary of Psychology does not even try to give a straightforward characterization. And there's a definition um, right after this passage from that psych source, which says something really crazy, like nothing worth reading has been written about it, and there's nothing really to say about it. So that's kind of weird, right? That should strike you as odd, because psychology, etymologically, is supposed to be discourse about the mind, study of the mind. And yet, this authoritative source within that discipline says we can't even define consciousness or that nothing worthy has been written about it. He says, what is central to consciousness, at least in the most interesting sense, is experience. But this is not a definition. At best, it is clarification. I presume that every reader has conscious experiences of his or her own. If all goes well... These characterizations will help establish that it is just those that we are talking about, right? So the thing that is the crux of our discussion right now on consciousness is experience. But experience is a really difficult word because it brings all this baggage with it. Um, as you're going to see, when Chalmers uses the word experience, 
he doesn't mean what most people you mean when they use the word experience casually like oh he's been through experiences oh he's seen some stuff that's not what he means he's talking about something much more fundamental and we all have these right we all have these conscious experiences of things and we'll get into that further shortly and he says it's just those that we're talking about right it's kind of hard to formulate but you know those things you feel those things you think that thing that's happening at every moment when you're awake that's the thing we're talking about to go on he says the subject matter is perhaps best characterized as the subjective quality of experience when we perceive think and act there is a whir of causation and information uh, information processing but this processing does not usually go on in the dark there is also an internal aspect there is something it feels like to be a cognitive agent this internal aspect is conscious experience conscious experiences range from vivid color sensations to experiences of the faintest background aromas, from hard-edged pain to the elusive experience of thoughts on the tip of one's tongue, from mundane sounds and smells to the encompassing grandeur of musical experience, from the triviality of a nagging itch to the weight of a deep existential angst, from the specificity of the taste of peppermint to the generality of one's experience of selfhood. All these have a distinct experienced quality. All are prominent parts of the inner life of the mind. So when he says experience, he means the subjective quality of experience. Meaning, not the quote-unquote facts about the experience that all of the outsiders watching would be able to describe, but rather what it feels like to experience that thing. So, for example, um, let's say there was a car accident and, and you were in the car accident and there was a lot of other people that saw the car accident. If you ask those people what happened, assuming they're accurate and honest, they would give you a series of facts, objective facts about the situation. Like it was two o'clock on a Wednesday, this purple car turned the corner and hit her car that was white and they sped off and went into the pole and the other person drove away. Like, that's not what he means by experience. The subjective character of the experience, the thing that you felt, or even the thing they felt when it happened, those are the things he's talking about, right? So not these detached quantitative facts, and we'll talk about that word in a little bit, but the inner experience of the thing, right? There is something it feels like to be one who thinks, one who is conscious. And he gives you all these examples of like smells and tastes and pains. All of those things have a distinct experience quality. It's not just like things are happening in your body, like how a thing is happening in a computer. It's like the things happen in your body and then they cause certain feelings, right? So for example, if you were to scratch yourself really hard, it would hurt. He's not talking about those physical underlying causes of the feeling of pain, but the pain itself. And, and we'll get to that more in a little bit. He says, we can say that a being is conscious if there is something it is like to be that being, to use a phrase made famous by Thomas Nagel. Similarly, a mental state is conscious if there is something it is like to be in that mental state. Equivalently, we can say that a mental state is conscious if it has a qualitative feel, an associated quality of experience. These qualitative feels are also known as phenomenal qualities, or qualia for short. The problem of explaining these phenomenal qualities is just the problem of explaining consciousness. This is the really hard part of the mind-body problem. Okay, so he's, he's trying his hardest to give us a definition. He says, a being is conscious if there is something it is like to be that being. And he references Thomas Nagel. If you do some research, he mentions this in the text, Nagel wrote this article in the 70s called, What Is It Like to Be a Bat? And this was an early 
uh, response to materialism and the sciences, arguments against materialism. And he talks about how we could never know what it's like to be a bat. We can know all the facts about how a bat's brain works. We can know all the facts about how a, a bat behaves, but we don't know what that feels like from the inside. And even if we emulated being a bat, like if I hung around upside down all day and blindly flew around, that still wouldn't let me know what it's like to be a bat. That would just show me that I know what it's like for me to pretend like I'm a bat. But there's this kind of unscalable wall we can't get through. Like We can't pass from the outside to the inside of something else. We only have access to our own inside. And that inside, uh, the inner movie, as Chalmers sometimes calls it, that's the thing it is like to be. And he calls this thing it is like to be a qualitative feel. And he keeps using this word quality. Now, I don't want you to get mixed up. When Chalmers uses the word quality and qualitative, he doesn't mean good. He doesn't mean like, that was a quality piece of bread. Or like, that was a a quality movie. Like, no, no, no. He means quality as in a quality of something. Um, He means quality as in not quantity, right? Not just numeric or objective facts, but the, the essence of the thing. And he uses this term qualia. That's a word you should be familiar with. Uh, that's one of those key terms I outlined on the, on the reading questions document, and you're going to see it over and over again. So the question about consciousness for Chalmers is essentially the question about qualia. And he said that's, that's the hard part of the mind-body problem. And he's going to get to this thing that we call the hard problem of consciousness. But on page four, he says, why should there be conscious experience at all? From a subjective viewpoint, it is the most familiar element of nature. But from an objective viewpoint, it is utterly unexpected. Taking the objective view, we can tell a story about how fields, waves, and particles in the spatiotemporal manifold interact in subtle ways, leading to the development of complex systems such as brains. In principle, there is no deep philosophical mystery in the fact that these systems can process information in complex ways, react to stimuli with sophisticated behavior, and even exhibit such complex capacities as learning, memory, and language. All this is impressive, but it is not metaphysically baffling. In contrast, the existence of conscious experience seems to be a new feature from this viewpoint. It is not something that one would have predicted from the other features alone. In other words, you can tell this story, um, as physicists often do, about how all the physical stuff out there interacts to create systems that do certain things. And you could talk about how these parts of the systems lead to these types of behaviors. But nothing in that is consciousness. In other words, if you were to have all the objective facts about the world, consciousness wouldn't be in those facts. Like you wouldn't be able to tell just from the physical facts alone that there's this rich inner movie going on in, in, in these things we call conscious creatures. So this, um, this idea that there's a gap between the objective facts and the internal states is going to take a focal point, right? It's going to be center stage, um, especially when we look at the next chapter. And he says, this is called the surprise principle. If all we knew about were the facts of physics and even the facts about dynamics and information, uh, information processing in complex systems, then the existence of conscious experience would come as a surprise to us. From the third person point of view, there seems to be no compelling reason to postulate the phenomenon. If it were not for our direct evidence in the first person case, the hypothesis would seem unwarranted, almost mystical perhaps. Yet, there is conscious experience. We know about it more directly than we know about anything else. The question is, how do we reconcile conscious experience with everything else we know? Right? This is the surprise. Consciousness would come as a surprise to us if we had all the facts about nature. Because there's something to consciousness that's not already contained in those fundamental physical facts. And this is going to lead to something... Um, that Frank Jackson called the knowledge problem that Chalmers builds upon in the third chapter. 
right? The only reason we know about consciousness, he thinks, is because we are living it. If we didn't have that first person access, we wouldn't even know it existed. And then on page 10, he says, conscious experience is not all there is to the mind. To see this, Observe that although modern cognitive science has had almost nothing to say about consciousness, it has had much to say about the mind in general. The aspects of mind with which it is concerned are different. Cognitive science deals largely in the explanation of behavior, and insofar as it is concerned with mind at all, it is concerned with mind construed as the internal basis of behavior, and with mental states construed as those states relevant to the causation and explanation of behavior. So the scientists of mind aren't really concerned with consciousness. What they are concerned with are like brain anatomy, um, the neurostructure of these things, how, how different parts of the brain correspond to different behaviors. That's what it's all about. Uh, Think back to when we dealt with Skinner. We said Skinner was a functionalist. Skinner said the subject is nothing other than how the subject functions. And all we have to do is map up, uh, map out the, the brain and the neural system and see how those correspond to certain behaviors, certain functions. That's all science does. But Chalmers isn't talking about that. He's not talking about the physical causal factors and a functional explanation of behavior, he's talking about that what it is like of the subject, that internal component that that the scientist can't study almost by definition because it's external, at least not in its current form. And this is where we get to the, the two concepts of mind, which was the title of this chapter. He says, at the root of all this lie two quite distinct concepts of mind. The first is the phenomenal concept of mind. This is the concept of mind as conscious experience and of a mental state as a consciously experienced mental state. This is the most perplexing aspect of mind and the aspect on which I will concentrate, but it does not exhaust the mental. The second is the psychological concept of mind. This is the concept of mind as the causal or explanatory basis for behavior. A state is mental in this sense if it plays the right sort of causal role in the production of behavior, or at least if it plays an appropriate role in the explanation of behavior. On the psychological concept, it matters little whether a mental state has a conscious quality or not. What matters is the role it plays in a cognitive economy. So there are these two different concepts of mind, right? So mind is is the overarching category. But then there's two different components to the mind. And Chalmers' beef is that in science, we're only paying attention to one type, but we're totally leaving this other type unexplored and potentially unexplorable if we don't open up our metaphysical basis um, to the prospect of dualism, right? His whole point is going to be we need some kind of dualism, even if it's not substance dualism, to account for this other thing. Right, so there's the phenomenal concept of mind, and this is the thing that he's concerned with. Right, this is the qualia, the what it's like to be. This is conscious experience, but then there's the psychological concept of mind. This is the functional stuff. Right, this is the causal stuff. This is the behavioral stuff. This is what psychologists, cognitive scientists, physicists are concerned with, not what it is like, but what role these physical systems play in the cognitive economy, right? Like what they do. He has a a nice little way of saying this. On the phenomenal concept, mind is characterized by the way it feels. On the psychological concept, the mind is characterized by what it does. There should be no question of competition between these two notions of mind. Neither of them is the correct analysis of mind. They cover different phenomena, both of which are quite real. It is only the fact that both are called mind that gives an appearance of competition. So neither of them are more important, or rather, neither of them are not special enough. Like, they're both important, right? They're both part of the mind. Neither is the correct analysis. They cover two different things. 
there are two different components to the mind, and we need to make sure we account for both of these. So remember, the phenomenal aspect of the mind is characterized by the way it feels. That's qualia. The psychological component is characterized by what it does. Right? That's the functional aspect. That's the quantitative rather than the qualitative component. So here are some examples that I think are going to help. Let's take a look at music. I assume that most, if not all, you listen to music in some capacity. So you could take any example. I mean, I know that sounds vague, but I mean literally any experienced thing ever and break it down into psychological and phenomenal components. So let's look at music. Let's take a, a specific song. So the psychological component would consist of all the physical facts that ground the song. So the sound waves, how the sound waves move and bounce off different things, how they interact with all the different parts of your ear, and how the electrical signals get sent through the nervous system from your ear to your brain. Right? That's about how physical stuff moves across the system. It's how about it's about how stuff interacts. It is quantitative, meaning it is measurable. It's functional. It's about what it does. But when you listen to music, that's not what's happening. Right? It's not like it's not just that those things are happening. When you listen to music, you're having some kind of internal experience. Right? There is something it is like to feel music. And that's the phenomenal component. That's the qualitative component. Think about when a computer, quote unquote, hears a song or when a computer detects sound. Pretend, for example, that you put your computer mic on and then you play something, like pick anything. Uh, do you think that when the computer detects that sound through its microphone is feeling something? No, of course not. It's just taking in and deconstructing uh, the sound into waves and converting it into binary and all these crazy things to make the computer function. But it, there's not something it is like to be a computer, right? That's just a, a system decoding information. However, when you hear music, it is not just like the computer taking in sound through the microphone. There is something it's, it's like. It could be moving. Uh, it could be confusing. It could be really loud and like loudness feels like something. It could be angry. It could be anything. That feeling is the, the qualia. But let's take another example. Eating, food. So the psychological component, let's, let's take an example. Um, Chalmers talks about chocolate later on but let's take something more vivid uh let's take something sour like a warhead or something so when you put the candy on your tongue there are these receptors in your tongue that send information across your nervous system to your brain right that's the quantitative elements the physical facts about what's happening in your body but again that's not all that's happening if you ask the computer to decode the composition of a, of a warhead or like a Sour Patch Kid, the computer's not tasting sour, even though there's information about the candy being sent to the computer. But when you taste it, it's like jarring, right? There's this crazy experience that happens where you make a weird face, your tongue feels a certain way, it like makes your whole body shake. And that feeling goes beyond the mere quantitative information that causes it, right? So that's another example. And another example I came up with was vision. So when you look at something, let's, let's take an example like, um, like a beach. Let's take a beach at sunset, like something really romantic like that. So the, phys uh, the psychological component would be the fact that when you're gazing out into the sunset over the ocean, there's light and its light is made of photons and waves and they're moving through the air at a specific speed and those light waves and photons bounce off of certain objects and then hit your eyes 
and interact with the anatomy of your eye and it sends information to your brain. But that's not what it feels like to look at a sunset on the beach, right? That's just the underlying physical systematic cause of it. The phenomenal component would be those those deep, almost indescribable feelings you get when you look out into the sunset. Or even, it doesn't have to be this complex. It could just be like a color. You know how when you look at a color like red, you're not just getting information. Like red feels like something, right? You look at red and it gives you all this stuff inside. But when a computer detects red, presumably the computer isn't feeling red. Or think about how when you look at red and then you look at green, it's not just like, I notice these waves, now I notice these waves. It's like there's a whole experience that goes along with that change. Like when you see red, it, it might make you feel deep or angry or something, especially in the context of a test maybe. But then when you see green, it's like, ah, oh, that feels good, right? And it's not just you're being aware that one corresponds to right answers and wrong answers. It's like even more primordial than that is the fact that there's this something it feels like to see those colors. That's the phenomenal component. So here's a, here's a recap. What Chalmers is doing in, in this earlier chapter of the book is setting the stage for his dualist argument by making this initial dis, uh, distinction between the psychological component of the mind and the phenomenal component of the mind. And the psychological component is quantitative. That is, it is objectively measurable. It is publicly accessible, right? We can all see these things. Whereas the phenomenal component is not quantitative, but rather is qualitative, meaning there's an internal aspect that's private that no one else can access besides the experiencer. And those individual instances of a phenomenal experience he calls qualia, right? That's what qualia are. Now, the actual argument against materialism and for dualism happens in the next section. This is just laying the stage. So if you don't see anything specific argument-wise yet, that's okay. But if you're starting to understand like, okay, these distinctions uh, are starting to make a little sense, that's good because he's going to tie it all together in the next lesson. And actually, um, the first three episodes of the podcast that me and Professor Rotolo do dealt with this exact stuff. We talked a lot about Descartes, a lot about Chalmers, and even Dennett. Um, and we talk a lot about qualia and the what it's like to be. So if you want to check it out, either because you're interested or because you feel like you need more material to help you understand the subject matter, check it out. Check it out. I emphasize that it's free. It might help. It might help. It's worth a shot. Uh, but that's it for today, guys. Uh, next time, we're going to be looking at the next section of The Conscious Mind by Chalmers. See you around.